Did you always or ever think someday I'd love to be on the Supreme Court? Or was this one of those, I know that you were nominated once and then you got, I mean, I understand your nomination, but you know, did you ever think someday I'm gonna be a, a Supreme Court justice? No, those are two different things. Most lawyers think it would be very nice to be on the Supreme Court, but most being pretty realist, understand there's a lot of luck involved in any, in any kind of appointment. So they don't expect to be on the Supreme Court, and certainly I didn't. When you are a judge, particularly on the Supreme Court, it could be the most technical case in the world. Well, you better learn it. You better figure it out. You better take the time. And the fact that it calls from you what you have to give uh, is uh, perhaps its greatest virtue. But that's what you miss about the court, you were telling me, though, that ability to kind of think toward the future yes. and figure out these problems. Yes. What else do you miss? Well, I, I like the people. I mean, I, I did actually. I did actually. It wasn't phony. And, <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, All of them. Yeah. The political people want to say, they desperately want to say that the judges are deciding on political bases. I don't think that's true. I think people do say that now. I, know that. I mean, that, that is a narrative about this Supreme Court well, led by conservatives. True. You don't um, believe it. No. I think what happens, it's more complicated. It's more subtle than that. Uh, what happens is people who are very interested in politics try to convince the appointing authorities mm -hmm. to appoint a judge, and they've looked at his work and so forth, appoint a judge or someone else who honestly believes that this way, X way, textualist way, originalist way, for example, is the right way to decide a legal case. And then we'll get a lot of what we want. Mm -hmm. But the people who are thinking politically are the people who are urging the appointment. When the judge decides the case, he thinks he's acting like a judge. Now, that makes a difference. I think a lot of people will be surprised to hear a liberal Supreme Court justice say, oh, no, they actually have good intentions. I just disagree with them. It seems like a lot of people believe um, that they're coming at this from a place of bad intentions, that they're corrupt, that um, the court has gone off the rails, that they're political. No, How I, dangerous I, is that? Or, or what is your take on that? I think that's unfortunate that they think that because I think that's inaccurate, really. And when I talk to the high school students, you know, I, 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 I like talking to high school students, and I'll, I'll take out my copy of the Constitution. Which you always carry with you? Well, it's in most of my suit pockets. You never know when somebody asks you a question. Do you have a Constitution in every suit coat? I don't know if I have a Constitution. But you don't just have one that you take around. Oh, no. They're not very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> because you do say in the book that this way of looking at the Constitution with originalism is actually that way of looking at the Constitution is harmful yeah, to I that do document. So. You use the word harmful. Yeah. And I that think it, it could is. potentially mean that the Constitution, if we keep looking at the law the way the conservatives on the court do, that document may not pass the test of time. There Those are, are pretty. There are risks. Risks. There are risks. And I, I, by, b believing that someone who basically disagrees with you about how, say, to interpret this document, or about other similar things. Believing that they're not necessarily bad people doesn't mean you have to agree with them. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you have to go along with the way they want to do it. And I think what's happened here, and that's what I've written about, is uh, it's very tempting, very tempting to think all you have to do is read the words. Mm -hmm. That's textualism. Yeah. Read the words. OK, I'll read the words. All judges read the words in the statute. But that's not oh, enough. No, no. I'd say there are other things. You uh, want to find out somebody wrote those words. The in purpose. The statute. The purpose. Why? Hmm? The purpose. Yes. Why? The values. Why? Yes. Values. The consequences. Yes. And you look at, that's what Marshall says, John Marshall, the great Chief Justice. He says, in a complicated case, you use the weapons that will help you, the tools that will help you. Don't limit them. Don't limit them see what is helpful in trying to interpret this Constitution so that it fits within what the people wanted, the values that it contains, the uh, statutes uh, serve a certain purpose, what? And that will probably uh, help produce an interpretation of law that will in fact help people live together peacefully, 
live together more productively. And we've got to do that now, not with 4 million people, but with 320 million. And so far, we've done it. Well, we've had a few errors, mm -hmm. <laughs> slavery, civil war, so forth, Jim Crow. But by and large, it's still there. And that helps keep us together. What is your method of interpreting the Constitution, focusing on the purposes, the values, the consequences? You call it, your approach is the more traditional approach. Um, and you write in the book that, that law must function so people can live productively and freely. That's an important part of the law. Um, but in some of the cases that we've had and that you write about um, and that you say, I mean, the, the alternative approach that seems to have a majority on the Supreme Court right now, do you think that's having harmful effects on the development of the law? No, it, 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 yes. <laughs> the, um, yes. Yes, I do think that. Uh, it sounds good. You see, it sounds good. It sounds one. I promise you as a textualist, my way of interpreting the Constitution and the statutes. It's simple. Mm -hmm. you just read it. And moreover, it will stop the judge who wants to substitute what he thinks is good for what the law says. He won't be able to do that very easily. I'll stop him in his tracks. So we'll get the laws passed by Congress. We will not get just what the judge thinks is good. Not the judges policy preferences. Correct, correct. And uh, it will be helpful to Congress because they'll know what to write to get their way. The text. Clear rules. Clear rules. And it will make it fairer because uh, across the uh, uh, large number of laws that are being interpreted, they'll come out roughly the same way with the same words. What a promise. Four wonderful promises. And I think that accounts in large part for this method of going about interpreting statutes, interpreting the Constitution. Look back and see what did these words mean when they were written to the average person. Popular. Popular because it sounds simple. And what I want to say is no, it isn't. No, it isn't simple at all. Most of the words in the statutes that we have in a constitutional case or in a statutory case in the Supreme Court, they're not so simple or why are they in the court? I mean, you read the word cost. It's in a statute. Cost. I know what it means. I always read the statute first, of course. If it says fish, that doesn't mean a flower. Got it. But it isn't that simple. Cost. There's a statute which says if you have a handicapped child, you can ask the school board to have a special education. And if you think what they're giving that child is not good enough, you can go to court and you can win. And you know what happens if you win, among other things? You get a better education for your child, but it's expensive. You have to pay for experts. Mm -hmm. Well, if you win, can you get the cost of paying for the expert? Is the cost of the expert a cost? Yeah, of course. So do you obviously get it? Well, maybe not. Maybe they just mean the cost of the lawyers. Oh, what is it? But look at the law. Yeah, look at not the law. There. there it is. It says the word cost. Right. Oh, well, thank you very much for all that help. You see, so you look back and see what did they say in Congress? And what you'll discover is every member of Congress voted for a report that said those, that word cost includes the fee of the expert. But our court said it didn't. You talk about um, several deficiencies in, in the, the method of originalism, and I want to use Dobbs to talk about several of mm -hmm. those. Number one, it's deeply regressive. Um, you write that this method is deeply regressive because, you know, when the Constitution was passed, when the 14th Amendment was ratified, who were the lawmakers then? Oh, exactly. And um, as uh, you are aware, they didn't include the women. Mm -hmm. They People didn't of include color. the slaves. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, go back White and say what? Mm -hmm. That's one problem. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another problem. Dobbs overruled cases that had been on the books for 50 years or more. Well, really, 
Now we're going to go overrule cases? Uh, we can do it sometimes, but you better be careful. You overrule too many cases and law will turn into chaos. Every client will say, lawyer, my lawyer, go overrule five cases, get them to overrule it. And before you know it, you won't know what the law is. So that can't be it. Well, what cases are they going to overrule? Those that were not done by an originalist or a, uh, a textualist method? That's all of them, <laughs> or nearly all. Let me not exaggerate. You, say it's, you say it's unprincipled. It's, yeah. There are no principles. But what is the principle? Is the principle that you think um, those cases decided then were really wrong, egregiously wrong, totally wrong? Oh, I see. You have to look to see whether you think they were really wrong. Ah, and how are you going to decide that? Well, I don't know. It's beginning to sound familiar. Now it's beginning to sound that you are going to take the cases that you think were really wrong. That sounds an awful lot like the judge substituting what he thinks is good for the law. The very thing, the very characteristic that the textualists said they wanted textualism to prevent. So how did they prevent it? I mean, you've written this book because you still have hope. It's not all the way there yet. Like Correct. we are in the middle of a paradigm shift, as you put it, Maybe. but we haven't, well, well you say, but yes. maybe we haven't gone all the way there. And yeah. so there's optimism, right? Yes. And you say um, that some of these justices that decided Dobbs had only been on the court for a couple years. That's They're true. new. And you write the way you write that, that they will see. Yes. I mean, so, I mean, do you think these justices being so new made an error in Dobbs, but they are still potentially will see yes. that error? You, you have hope. I don't know if they better go back and overrule Dobbs or not, but, but, but an approach, an approach. Mm -hmm. Would you have joined the Chief Justice's uh, opinion in Dobbs if it had come down to a uh, As a majority or as a preventing of the overruling? Mm -hmm. I would have had to decide that at the time. I wonder, would you? Have you, would you have considered well, I have I, uh, Hypotheticals are... To something. prevent the overruling of Roe. Oh, well, maybe, maybe, mm -hmm. and maybe not, I mean, but uh, maybe. But it was moot with the, the addition of Justice Barrett. That's right. Mm -hmm. Maybe I would have, and then we'd had, we wouldn't have overruled uh, Roe, we wouldn't have overruled Casey, and we would have been a, a 15, what is it, 50, uh, 15, 15 weeks. months instead 15 of... 15 weeks. Uh, 15 weeks instead of whatever, and a lot of European countries have that. There was a lot to be said. You might have you. considered that. I certainly would have considered it. I certainly would have considered it. I to might have joined it. I, I, I didn't have to decide it, you know. I'm sorry I didn't have to decide it. Mm -hmm. because it meant that, that Roe and Casey were overruled. But That's that good. shows what, to your point about listening and listening, trying to find... compromise, mm -hmm. take 30 percent uh, rather than no percent. Mm -hmm. Not always true, but generally. You've written this book for an engaged audience uh, who, and it's an important book. I think you've written this book also for three of the new conservative justices. That's up to them. I might like it if they read it, yes. But I mean, you say in the book, they're new. Yeah. They'll, and you, like you believe, we'll see. They'll. Yes. That's what I think. You think what? I think that we'll see. They'll be there a long time. We'll get nine. We got nine, we used to get nine about 40% of the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> five, four was about 15%, 20%. And in that conference room, in 28 years, I have never heard a voice raised in anger. I don't think ever. It's polite. Ever. I can't think of ever. Not even Bush versus Gore. No. I think they were wrong. So I can say that. I said, this is not a good idea. <laughs> but you bad. didn't shout it. No. Absolutely not. People respect each other. They respect each other's points of view. Or they don't necessarily agree with those points of view. But then say, why? And what I uh, end up usually telling the high school kids or the law school kids, and they say, well, what should we do? I say, what should we do? Uh, get out and participate, but you want me to be detailed? I'll tell you something. I'll tell you a secret. It's not my world anymore. It's yours. Mm -hmm. And you're the ones who will decide how to keep it together. So go out there and do it.